audio description writer Justin Soule, and you're listening to the Audio Description Narrators of America Know Your Narrator series, Beyond Your Narrator episode. Today we're very happy to have Juan Alcazar, a filmmaker. Thanks for joining us, Juan. Hey, welcome to be here, Roy. Let's jump right in. What do you love about audio description? Uh, well, from the, I have two perspectives on this. From the consumer point of view, I think it's awesome because, well, as someone who has lost a decent amount of over the past few years, it's just nice to be able to watch a few things because at first I didn't realize that uh, I was missing out on so much until I started watching some movies with AD turned on. And then that's when I was like, wait a second. I thought this was just this was just a blank screen and there's actual stuff going on. There's like descriptions going on. I thought it was just nothing. <laughs> and from the other perspective is as someone who makes content, I can appreciate the work that goes into this and now I'm able to see this as part of the filmmaking process and just how critical it is. So I can appreciate this on two different levels. As a content creator, you said it's critical to have audio description. Why is that? Well, I mean, I do come at this from a kind of a different perspective because as a legally blind person, I do see things a little bit differently than just someone who is completely sighted who's making movies. Most of the time, I'm assuming that most people who are sighted aren't thinking about this stuff until they get to post-production. And for me, I've recently changed this perspective. I'm trying to keep in mind stuff like audio descriptions because I may add it to it or I may just be more descriptive with a piece of dialogue or just might, might think about like how would a piece of audio description fit in if I were to add a track. So it's just become part of the filmmaking process for me. In other interviews, you've talked about how you don't see audio description as being tacked on, but it is a, a part of uh, either production or, or post-production. Can you help clarify that a little more for our audiences? And this is also based on interviews I've done with you and times I've talked with you as well. But a lot of times during production, it's like you have the planning stage when you're writing, which is pre-production. Then you have the actual filming part, which is production and editing effects, taking care of the sound, etc. That's post-production. And usually audio description is left until it's one of the very last things that's put on there. And a lot of times because studios or filmmakers want to just get it done as fast as possible they tend to just do it rather fast sometimes it doesn't have the best of quality sometimes it does but sometimes it doesn't so that's what i mean by tacking it on at the end that speed <laughs> when you're rushing something that that can possibly sacrifice quality and it's it's an inconsistent experience yeah, I mean, it's the whole time is money kind of scenario. But then again, if that were the case, you would think the AD would come in a little sooner in post-production. Uh, I'm not saying it would be coming in during production, but still it wouldn't be saved until the very last minute. When you think about some challenges that you faced with audio description, either as a content creator or as a consumer, are there any examples that you can think of that you're really proud of how you overcame them? I think a good example would be because, like I did say, I, I am legally blind. I do wear glasses because they do correct my vision somewhat. But a lot of times, like let's say it's the end of the day and I've done a lot of just maybe video work, or just a lot of been using my eyes for a long time. By the time I'm ready to watch something on Netflix or anywhere else, I'm having migraines and I can't really see anything or, I mean, I could, but then again, do I really want to keep these migraines going? So a lot of times I've noticed that I tend to just take the glasses off and just put the AirPods on and just go to town with Netflix and uh, turn on the AD. And the funny thing is a lot of times, even though I'm just seeing a blurred image on screen, I don't feel like I'm missing out too much because it depends on the quality of the, of the audio track. But still, I mean, for me, it's felt like I haven't missed too much with having the AD turned on and me not being able to see any details on screen. I love how you say that. It's something, you're not missing things. That uh, it's, uh, it's another form of connection that the, that the creative content still comes through. Yeah, I mean, in a way, it's kind of like, I'm not saying they're the same thing, but like an audio book. You hear the narration, you hear the details, and you just fill in the rest with your mind. In a way, it's kind of a, sort of a similar way with audio descriptions. So, like I said, two different things, but still relatively similar. If we could go back to quality of audio description, can you think of some things that affect quality in audio description for you? I'll go back to the audiobook example. Like, a good one would be 
when you're ready to listen to an audiobook and you're you know you want to listen to to this book series or anything like that and then you realize the first few seconds like holy cow this this narrator's not going to do it this person's not going to do it they're taking me out of it and it's like crap what do I do now? Do I just like sit and bear it? <laughs> and so, yeah, that really kind of takes me out of it. Sometimes I do just hang in there, but sometimes just the way the person's reading lines, it just doesn't, in comparison when it's a narrator who's more into the project, you can tell, you can just tell. It's one of those things that you can just hear when they're more invested and they're more invested in having you enjoy the project more it's funny it's like you might not notice these things right off the bat but the more you listen to them the more you start paying attention to them and it sounds like the way that you're saying paying attention to the narrator that means that she's keeping you within the story that's being told is that is that right yeah i mean the irony is that the more you actually pay attention the more the narrator just kind of recedes into the background because it just matches everything so it's almost like yeah the narrator is being more noticeable but in a way that they blend into everything else and like i said that's where the whole filmmaking process comes in because if you're going from a something that's more familiar with people if you're watching something and you're like oh that was a nice tracking shot or that was a nice take if you're paying attention to what the camera's doing it's like are you really getting into the film or TV show, or, or are you now taken out of it because you're aware of one of those elements that came into the making of the film? So when you're talking about some of those technical details of the director, the DVDs used to have director's commentaries. And I'm curious how you feel about maybe a audio description track that also has a second audio description track that does go into those filmmaking details, what's happening on screen, how the camera's moving. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that because uh, I was actually, I kind of got this idea from one of your podcast episodes, actually, when you interviewed, uh, I think, Chris Danielson from uh, NFB, and you both were just just talking about, like, extra audio content that could be catered for the blind audience, and I was like, okay, this is pretty cool, but I thought to myself, wait, okay, how can that be incorporated in a more, I don't know, creative way? So I started brainstorming. I'm like, wait, maybe adding a track where something like almost a prologue where the narrator would say visual details that the audience would not be able to get. Like a good example in the movie 1917, which you narrated actually, as good as that movie was, nowhere in the AD track did it mention that this was done in one take or it was made to look like it was done in one shot. And that would have been nice if that was somehow included as some sort of Easter egg or bonus. But the thing is, like, if you're completely blind, you're not going to know that this was done in one take. So it'd be nice to add kind of commentary like that. Or maybe I think you suggested that maybe having the narrator be almost like a character in a film or a show. I think that would be like a, an awesome level of immersion that I think a blind audience would get a kick out of, I think. It, it depends on the genre, but if it's genre appropriate, I think that would be awesome. Like when you purchase a movie on iTunes or something like that, and you have like this bonus content where it preloads before the actual movie starts and it gives you that extra audio content for a blind viewer and then the movie starts. I don't know. I, ju I, I just think there's there's a lot of places this can go and it's it's really exciting, actually. <laughs> yeah. And thinking about live theater, live audio description, and how that's already happening with audiences arriving beforehand to either have the sets or costumes uh, described or, or shared and introducing the characters. That It's very similar to that. And with the, as you use the analogy that these bonus episodes, like what Chris was talking about, that that can help bring even more content to our audiences. Yeah, I mean, it's like, uh, like you said, the touch tours that people have with, uh, with, uh you know, stage productions. I think that's really cool. If there was just a way to somehow include that into movies or TV shows and more visual content, I think a blind audience would be more invested in what they're watching. I'm not saying that they're not already, but I think it would just make it easier to be even more invested in just the story, the characters, etc. It really sounds like technology is helping with the creative aspects of access. It is, but there still needs to be some work done. But granted, it's great that uh, there's something available at the moment. 
Well, let's talk about that. Where would you like to see audio description go? If you could have your dream world. If I could have my dream world, okay. I kind of have a bone to pick with uh, with this topic a little bit. Well, a lot. <laughs> Last year, I made a video on my YouTube channel talking about why classic films are not audio described. And look, I, I get it. Recent movies, the new releases, they're going to get priority over the classic ones. And it's likely more difficult to describe the classic ones because there's all these historical elements, all these norms that are probably different. I recently watched Dial M for Murder, the Alfred Hitchcock movie, and it was great that it was audio described. But then again, it's like the result, these little nuances that pertain to the time period that the film was shot and released. And it was just interesting hearing that. So I can understand why it's likely more difficult to narrate something like that. But part of me just kind of gets annoyed a little bit when I'm like, okay, well, Citizen Kane and uh, Vertigo and, uh, you know, North by Northwest don't have audit descriptions, but Cats and Trolls World Tour does. <laughs> so <laughs> another thing is foreign films. I've wanted to watch the movie Parasite for a while now, and it just irks me that at least that film, it's like, why doesn't that have audio descriptions? Because, okay, I get it. It's likely a lot tougher to describe a foreign film because not just you have to describe what's going on on screen, but also have maybe another narrator reading back what would be subtitled. So that's that can be pretty difficult. But still, I mean, you would think that the film that won Best Picture for this year would at least be audio described in America. And with those examples of non-English speaking films that the sighted audiences have access to dubbed versions. I'm thinking about some of the titles that aren't even films, but series that are on the different streaming platforms that are dubbed and dubbed in a way that is a little different than, you know, 30 years ago when I'm thinking of Godzilla dubs that might not have been as, <laughs> as immersive, but the dubbing voice talents have really brought a performance game that's an experience that, if not equal to the non-English speaking, it's it's pretty close. It seems like it's just in a figuring out the alliance between the dub that already exists for sighted people and adding audio description. Oh, yeah. I mean, just look at anime as an example. I mean, it's like some dubbing has done so well for anime that uh, you almost forget that the original track is in Japanese. So, <laughs> I mean, that goes to show you that. Yeah, that kind of talent should be sought out for with foreign language movies. So we've got to get the classics covered, which is starting to happen. Got to get anime and get some more uh, non-English speaking titles, specifically the best picture wins. Yeah, and also to go off on a bit of a tangent, though, this is just starting off, but video games should also start getting that treatment sometime soon because... It's great that The Last of Us 2 was such an achievement in accessibility in video games. You know, that's awesome, and I'm hoping that continues. But the thing is, I've heard a few people say that the one critique that they did have for it is that the cutscenes were not audio described. They were saying that it could help in the future if cutscenes were audio described, just like how films are. But still, I'm really hoping that The Last of Us 2 wasn't just a one-off kind of thing. I'm hoping that this trend continues and I'm hoping that this accessibility trend spreads into the video game realm because yeah, I mean, there are gamers who are legally blind or totally blind. Another thing that hasn't been covered as far as accessibility is concerned is something like YouTube. I know that there's a website called You Describe and it's great. It's great that there's volunteers who are available to describe certain YouTube videos, but the thing is there's so many YouTube videos out there that it might be better for YouTube to incorporate a secondary track for creators, not just to have audio descriptions for, but just a secondary track to have commentary, like creators' commentaries or just put Easter eggs in there or just anything like that. I mean, make it accessible, but also make it useful for the general public because most of the time when something becomes accessible, it's because it's also been made for the general public, like audio description. Some people, maybe they're running errands or doing something, but they have ADs turned on. They'll still be able to follow along without having to look at the screen closed captions. If someone's watching a video late at night or TV late at night, they can turn on closed captions and still follow along in a way. So it's the whole universal design aspect. It's like, it's great if it's made specifically for blind audiences, but at the same time, it's going to be even more beneficial when there's going to be a benefit to the general public as well. 
There's one more thing I'd like to mention that I've re recently gotten passionate about as well. So as great as it is for both of us to be talking about AD and accessibility, because I come from a film school background, it would be great if a film school or just an online course was created to cover both disability history in movies, just how disability was portrayed in the movies back in the day to present day, but also how to incorporate audio descriptions, how to write good closed captions, how to write for audio descriptions, things like that, how to make your content more accessible. And I think that would be awesome if there was a film school course or an online course to cover that because the more people behind the camera that are aware of this, the more things like these aren't going to be just thought of as, uh, oh, let's just add them on at the end to check off a box. You know, it can be part of the filmmaking process instead. I'm hoping it happens. I'm not sure if it will, but I'm really hoping, crossing my fingers here. But then again, I'm not just going to be crossing my fingers. I'm, I got to be advocating for this stuff too. So yeah, somebody's got to get the ball rolling on that. <laughs> How can we follow you on either on social media or otherwise? My YouTube channel is called JC5 Productions, so just the JC and the number five productions. I'm on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at JC12209. It's something I've had to live with after I changed everything to JC5 Productions. And the Facebook, I'm on there as JC5 Productions on Facebook as well. Great, Juan. Thanks so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me, Roy.